This is American Government Monday, August 31st, 2020. Um, first, let's get a sense of where we are in the course and what you're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. I sent an email out about this, but let's uh, remind you. Um, again, tomorrow we're starting, we're making the transition from the period of the revolution and the Declaration of Independence to the great act of founding, the drawing up of the Constitution that, as I already mentioned in one of my lectures previously, that uh, uh, William Gladstone, uh, the great English prime minister, uh, called the Constitution of the United States the greatest single act of the mind of man ever struck off in a single time and place. And that's what we're going to be capturing in the next week. So um, uh, to tomorrow, um, our concentration is on, uh, I'll, I should say today, um, I'm going to uh, do my second uh, realm of historical background. Uh, the first was the history that led up to the Declaration. This is going to be the history that leads from the Declaration to the Constitution, the founding period, the 11-year period between 1776 and 1780, uh, 1787, that, which is the Constitutional Convention. Um, the third set of history will be on Wednesday, by the way, and that's a very micro history when we look at the uh, internal dates of the four-month Constitutional Convention that went from May 25th, as you'll see. Uh, to September 17th, but that's for Wednesday. So today, today we're going to look at the overall period of the time, and essentially this is the time of the Articles of Confederation. Um, if you remember, Lee's Resolution for Independence had three components. One, uh, dissolve the political bands, and that became part of the Declaration of Independence in its first and last paragraphs. Um, uh, form alliances and everything like that, but then also form convenient Articles of Confederation. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the country declared independence. And as you'll see, um, the date that um, that kind of links um, uh, the Declaration of Independence, um, even though the, the Revolutionary War had started the year before with Lexington and Concord in 1775, 17, uh, uh, independence was declared on July 4th, 1776. And the war continued, as you'll see, until uh, 1781. So uh, in 1777, John Dickinson of Pennsylvania chaired and drafted the Articles of Confederation, and they were sent out to the state capitals during the Revolutionary War, and they were adapted the same year that the war itself ended. So we were technically governed. Uh, gov the, uh, the officials became our artificial, our, 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 our official, sorry, I must say official uh, uh, fabric of government, actually only until 1781 when the war ended and continued up through 1789, as you'll see. So uh, then we'll talk about the defects of the articles. We'll talk about its overall structure and, and then why it failed. And it was the failure of the Articles of Confederation that set up the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and when we turn to the convention on, on Wednesday, you'll see the framers learned from all kinds of things, from history, from philosophy, but they were also very practical and experienced in government. And the two most important individuals of this period, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, were both, as you'll see, members of the Continental Congress under the Articles. And so it was, the, it was their watching their first system of government fail that actually went into much of the construction of the Constitution. Um, so uh, we will go from uh, the the drafting of the Articles in 1777 through the historical period where we were governed under the Articles, the failure of the Articles, and we'll end today with um, uh, moving towards the Constitutional Convention. On Wednesday, we'll turn to that convention, and uh, we'll do a, a, I'll, do, I'll do a micro tour of the major dates within those four months between May 25th, 1787, and September 17th. Uh, 1787. Um, the readings for, and by the way, uh, for this whole period, Wilson chapter two, the rest of it, the first couple of pages had to do with the declaration and, and the early part of the revolution. The rest of chapter two has to do with the general founding period, the events, the failure of the articles, the constitutional convention, and, uh, and the end of the founding period with 1791, which was the ratification of the Bill of Rights. Um, 
So uh, uh, that chapter is background for this whole week, uh, and even for last week with the Declaration. So, uh, but specifically for Wednesday, uh, in the Nichols Reader are the records from the Federal Convention. And that in particular means the plans of government that the convention actually dealt with. So you're going to see the forming of the Constitution was sort of like at a restaurant when you have a, a menu in front of you. You have several choices. Uh, the Constitutional Convention was remarkable for its ability to analyze the defects of the Articles of Confederation and then to consider different emotional, uh, institutional alternatives that culminated, of course, in the synthesis and creating of the Constitution. Um, the Nichols um, include, therefore, the plan that you'll come to see as the Virginia plan submitted on May 29th and the New Jersey plan submitted on June 15th. Alexander Hamilton, uh, more about that on Wednesday, who's clearly one of the most brilliant men of all time, let alone America, uh, um, uh, proposed his own plan at the convention called, appropriately, the Hamilton Plan. And interestingly enough, the Nichols have both the Virginia Plan, the, L the structure of the Virginia Plan, and the New Jersey Plan. But for some reason, they only included part of Hamilton's speech introducing the Hamilton Plan. I have sent you the Hamilton Plan, along with the PRQs, the preparation and review questions for the Constitutional Convention. And then on Thursday, uh, uh, Friday, um, uh, uh, let me back up. So on Wednesday, we'll see how the convention created the Constitution, and we'll see the major institutional, what I like to call the three major institutional novelties. The Constitution of the United States, in some ways, was a remarkably uh, novel and new kind of government. And in particular, you'll see it, it, it possessed three remarkable new f institutional or political features, which were the first of their kind in the world. And we'll explore those. Then on Friday, we'll turn to what I like to call the theory of the Constitution. Uh, especially, we'll read two of the most complex and famous uh, theoretical essays in the Federalist Papers that together form what I like to call the theory of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, all constitutions, as we saw, um, have, have ideas underneath them. But it's remarkable the extent to which the, the founders, the drafters of our Constitution, especially the two most brilliant drafters uh, and explainers of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, uh, coherently imagined a theoretical, uh, theoretical substructure. And that substructure or that infrastructure or, or foundation, theoretical foundation of the Constitution is human nature. So, uh, and you'll see, as Diamond suggests in his essay that we read for Friday, that uh, that the, the Declaration makes us think about human nature. It, it's an es The Declaration of Independence is an essay on human nature. So it's not an accident that when we finally come to the set of institutions that has governed America, American life for almost 250 years, that the, the, the creators of that uh, institutional framework uh, were guided uh, by a, a meditation on human nature. As, as Madison says in Federalist 51, um, but what is government but the greatest of all reflections of human nature? And so it is. So um, that will be this week. Next week, the last major issue of the founding week we're going to consider next Monday, uh, the uh, 7th, is we'll turn to the very controversial issue of slavery and race in the founding, which has become controversial anew because the New York Times instituted a product project in uh, 2019 called the 1619 product, uh, Project. And the thesis of this project is that the true foundation of the nation was not 1776 or 1787, the Declaration of the Constitution. It was 1619 when the first uh, African-American slaves were imported to America. Uh, and the concept of the 1619 founding of America has become very uh, popular, very controversial. So we'll read part of that project, the 1619 Project, by its primary author. We'll, lead, we'll read the, a critic of that by the historian uh, 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 Will, William McClay, William McClay. And then we'll read excerpts from a book where, uh, from a third author who tries to see a middle point or articulate a compromise between the 1619 Project and its, and its uh, uh, critics. On Wednesday, September 9th, 
I there are no PRQs uh, uh, or preparation and review question for that session. I'll I'll do a summary and then uh, for your Zoom sessions that week on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, I'll allow you essentially to ask any questions at that point and we'll address them that you may not have been able to answer. I won't answer them for you, but I'll certainly help them with you, help you with them. The exam will be, our first midterm will be on Friday, September 11th, and it will be a take-home examination, and I'll talk more about that. I sent out uh, um, an indication of that on the, in the email, and it will be based upon your PRQs. So let's turn to um, the subject of today's lecture, the Articles of Confederation, the history of the Articles, the Articles of Confederation themselves, the failure, and the movement towards the Constitutional Convention. Um, so if you're looking on the notes, these are the second set of dates that you have to be responsible for. Uh, the great question in the mind of all students is, will this be on the exam? These dates will be on the exam along with the asterisk dates from the set of notes about the history of the revolution. So let's begin. I actually should have listed this as a first date. It's included within the first date. And that's 1777. 1777, again, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, was, was when um, uh, John Dickinson chaired the committee that drafted the article. So the Articles Confederation, our first government, were drafted during the from the Second Continental Congress, which actually passed the Declaration. A, a year later, 1777, they were finished, and they sent them out to the state governments, which one by one ratified them. The Articles, as you will see, requires unanimous uh, ratification of, of the, all 13 articles. Why do you think there were 13 articles in the Articles Confederation? Um, uh, and, and as you'll see, one of the great problems with the articles was to, re to change the articles, to amend them, required the unanimous, unanimous assent or agreement of all 13 states. And as you're going to see, in politics and human life, the moment that you require unanimity, that everyone agreed to everything, you're really making something impossible. And one of the great defects of the articles was, not only was its structure and powers defective, it was almost impossible within that framework to solve those problems because uh, to change the articles required unanimity or uh, all of the 13 states together. So let's begin with a list of dates that you're really accountable for. 1781, um, again, the last state ratified the Articles in 1781, so that's actually the date in which the Articles became official. Because up until the point where they're ratified, the same with the Constitution, too, by the way, it's only a proposal. So in 1781, uh, the Articles were, were finally ratified and became official. That's also the year the war ended. Uh, on October 19th, the Battle of Yorktown, as I think I mentioned in the first uh, round of dates, uh, uh, George Washington with his brilliant captain Alexander Hamilton and 5,000 American troops with 7,000 French troops and ships off the shore of Yorktown. Lord Cornwallis surrendered, uh, who was the, the commander-in-chief of British forces, surrendered and therefore ended the war on October 19, 1781. The next major date then was the Treaty of Paris uh, in 1783, uh, fashioned in London. Uh, I'm actually in Paris, and then, but of course it was between London and uh, and America. Our capital at that point was um, uh, Philadelphia, which, and then you'll see our capital became New York City, and then uh, and then Washington D.C. So uh, this this is important uh, because this was the treaty, the formal recognition by British by the British of the uh, independence of the United States. So the end of the war gave rise to, in the same way that the end of World War I gave rise to the Treaty of Versailles, the Treaty of Paris is where British Britain formally relinquished the, its colonies and we, were, we recognized independence. Now, this is going to be important, as you'll see later on, <coughs> because two of the provisions of the Treaty of Paris of 1783 was that the British would evacuate all the forts. The British evacuated... Uh, uh, occupied a whole system of forts uh, between the in the western what was at that point the western boundary of the colonies essentially the Appalachian Mountains all the way through the Mississippi River they had won that territory in the 1754 French and Indian War and they had agreed to to abandon those forts and turn them over to American authorities why is that important because they didn't in other words they didn't comply with the uh, provisions of their own treaty and you're going to see why is that important what could we do about it? 
nothing because it turns out the government of the Articles was so weak and so ineffective that we couldn't even hold the British to the provisions of the treaty in which they granted us independence. Another issue that became critical from the Treaty of Paris was the issue of impressment. Impressment was where uh, civilians would be drafted into the British Navy. And many British civilians ended up drafted into the British Navy that way. But the British continued to impress. They would capture merchant marine and other American ships and impress Americans into the British Navy, which meant, of course, they weren't recognizing our independence that they agreed to. And again, the reason that's important is there's nothing that we could do about it because we, our government was so weak and feeble. The next important date is 1786 to 1887. Now, the war, and like many wars, destroyed the American economy because it was fought on American soil, and therefore there was a lot of destruction from the war, just in the same way that Europe in World War I and World War II was, was demolished, much of, much of Europe, because the war was fought there. Uh, but also, don't forget, Britain was our major trading party partner, partner. And when during the war, that trade all but ceased, and that meant, and we were essentially an agricultural nation of farmers, and and therefore our ability to export. Therefore, the country went into a profound and deeper re re recession, even depression. And um, and so, uh, in 1786, Captain Daniel Shea in Massachusetts, a former veteran, or a veteran, I should say was so frustrated because uh, with all the, the farmers out of work, of course, just as in the same issue with the pandemic today or during the Depression, when people lost their income, they couldn't afford their mortgage payments on their house or their farm. And so uh, uh, creditors, bankers, et cetera, uh, crediting institutions um, began to foreclose on mortgages and farmers. And Daniel Shea led a band of disaffected farmers to march on the capital of Massachusetts and to stage a kind of rebellion or protest. This is known as Shea's Rebellion. And it's interesting, uh, the, the views of this rebellion have kind of changed over history. And, um, and, and uh, I'm going to say its main political importance, but historians have become much more sympathetic to the economic distress of many uh, Americans during this time. Um, just as, by the way, many Americans are in economic distress now because of the lockdown and because of the effect of the pandemic. So um, why was this important? Because this act of, of violence and civil disobedience sent a shockwave through the political elite of the United States. It became one of the major signs that the political fabric, that the economic, the social, uh, the national fabric of the country was beginning to deteriorate into chaos and disorder. And uh, Everyone came to understood that it was the enfeebleness and the weakness of the political system that in some ways was at the heart of these problems. So Shea's Rebellion is important because it's a catalyst for beginning for the political elite beginning to turn to a political solution, that is to say a new constitution, to the nation's distress. Now the other event in 1786 is in, in September is two young members of Congress. Uh, James Madison, who was only, I think, 32 at the time, and Hamilton, who was relatively young, about 34 or 5, I think, very pretty young. Um, they were members of Congress, of the Continental Congress under the Articles. Uh, and Hamilton, of course, was from New York City, and Madison was uh, a young Virginian, very short, five foot four, the hobbit of the founding generation, but a brilliant man. They had served in Congress. And also, uh, they were aware of each other from the Constitutional Convention. I'm sorry, <laughs> they would become aware. I let me get my dates out in order here. Um, and so they had served in Congress, and they knew its weaknesses and its inability to govern the country. And so they cooperated and had Congress declare a, con a convention in Annapolis in September of 1786 with a very limited purpose, to simply beef up Congress's power to regulate commerce. The Annapolis Convention was a failure. Only five states even bothered to send delegates, and they couldn't agree on anything except one thing. And this is why the Annapolis Convention is part of history. Madison and Hamilton got the delegates to agree to send a resolution, to adopt a resolution to send to Congress to call for another convention. 
only this convention, which was to be held in Philadelphia, in the same building, by the way, Independence Hall, as it came to be called, that the Declaration had been adopted in, um, uh, in the next year to create or propose a new constitution. So you could say the Annapolis Convention is the embryo of the constitutional or federal convention that created the Constitution. So in 1787, and we'll, this is what we'll end with today, was the congressional resolution that Congress passed on, in, on February 21st in 1787 that called for the Constitutional Convention. And so 1787 is the year that the Constitution was created. <clears throat> the Constitutional Convention, the federal convention, called both by historians met in Philadelphia from May 25th until September 17th. And so um, uh, that then, when the, con when the Constitutional Convention finished the Constitution, its last day was September 17th, only five days after September 12th, which also will go down in eternal history as my birthday. Yes, it's true. Anyway, um, uh, September 12th is an important day in the convention, not because it's a foretaste of my birthday, although that's enough to celebrate. Um, so uh, it's also the period of what's called ratification. The Constitution then was sent to the Congress, then sent out to the state governments for ratification, as in Article 7, the ratification procedure. And very early, uh, Delaware, which is why the license plates in Delaware say first in freedom, Delaware ratified the Constitution in uh, late November, early December, then Pennsylvania, and then what happened was it got stalled in New York. Now, as I said in my lecture on the historical circumstances of the revolution, there were two states which were absolutely central to the revolution and eventually, of course, to the eventual success of America. All the states were important, but who cares about Rhode Island? It's only about as large as my driveway. Just kidding. Rhode Island is a lovely place, um, and I-95 goes right through it. Um, uh, uh, so um, New York and Virginia because they were the largest states geographically, economically, population, and they were also central, because New York uh, linked the, no 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 the New England states with the Middle Atlantic states, and then Virginia linked the Middle Atlantic states to the Southern states. So it was absolutely essential that these two states ratify the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton was from New York and was not only, and was a member of the New York Ratifying Convention too, um, and uh, and the Constitution was very close. It only passed by three votes, and and before and and uh, Hamilton were very hard. There was a strong opposition to um, uh, the Constitution in New York because uh, uh, Clinton, uh, George Clinton was the governor, and he didn't want to relinquish governor or state power. So even though New York was one of the largest um, uh, states, there was strong opposition. So Alexander Hamilton thought it would be a good idea to get the other brilliant mind uh, from the convention and from uh, his personal knowledge, James Madison, to write, and along with John Jay, an important American statesman who helped them navigate or na negotiate the Treaty of Paris, uh, to write 85 newspaper essays in favor of the Constitution. Um, and so Hamilton wrote about two-thirds of those, and we'll come back to the, I'm going to talk more about the actual layout and structure of the Federalist Papers on Friday. But um, but those papers then were passed out. They were pa read in newspapers. And like the Constitution itself, um, you have to remember, as I mentioned earlier, that Americans were one of the most literate population on earth because we'd been founded by Puritan Christians who believed in the reading of the Bible. So. Um, the Constitution was widely distributed, widely argued in churches, in bars, in, temp in, in hotels, uh, in town squares, and in newspapers. America was a newspaper-reading country. And so um, it's clear that uh, after the New York did ratify the convention, the Constitution, then the, the, newspaper, the, the Federalist Papers were quickly bundled together and sent throughout the rest of the Union and did have an important influence, especially in Virginia, on the ratification struggle. So um, uh, that period then ends in 1788 when the ninth state ratified the Constitution. And as in Article 7 of the Constitution says, when the conventions of several states, of seven, uh, nine states ratify, it'll go into effect. So once that happened in June of 1788, the ratification period was over. And it was very clear, and the rest of the states ratified it. 
1788, then, in October, November of 1788, elections under the new constitution were held. And on March 4th, 1789, the new constitution went into effect when Congress met in Philadelphia, late, of course, for the first time. And as we'll see in Article 2, Congress met in joint session and counted the electoral votes for president. George Washington unanimously won all the electoral votes of the states and was declared as president. And he went on a three-week tour up from Mount Vernon, which is right south of Washington, up to New York City, which was our capital. He took the oath of office and the government was underway. Uh, that first Congress did several major things. It set up the executive branch, consistent with Article 2. It set up the judiciary branch, consistent with Article uh, 3. Um, and, more important, men, much opposition to the Constitution during the ratification struggle was unsettled. And many states only ratified the Constitution on the promise that there would be amendments immediately that would address some of the criticisms of the Constitution. James Madison was uh, elected the first uh, House of Representatives from Virginia. He drafted the Bill of Rights. The House adopted, sent them to the Senate, and, the, and they were sent out in 1789 to the states. There were originally 12 proposed amendments, but only 10 were adopted, and that the first 10 amendments came to be known as the Bill of Rights, which were finished in 19, uh, 1780, or 1791. So the founding period of the country really ends in 1791 with the ratification of the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. You will see that one of those amendments, one of the two amendments that didn't get ratified, floated around for a while, in fact, about 200 years, until in 1992 it was ratified as the 27th Amendment. So the last amendment to the Constitution, the 27th Amendment, and we'll talk about what that is when we talk turn to the Constitution, was actually proposed in 1789. That is the history of the founding period. So let's now turn to the great question of the nature of the articles and their defects. Now, I've been teaching this material for a long, long time, uh, uh, since um, uh, people first scrawled pictures on cave walls. I've been teaching um, uh, uh, American government since 40,000 BCE. Um, here's a question that students always seem to ask or have in the back of their minds. If the articles were, were so bad, a form of government, and the defects are pretty obvious, by the way, were these people stupid? And it turns out that they were not stupid. They were brilliant. But what explains in some ways the defective character of the articles, not only just the fact that it was a first try, but it wasn't a first try because the moment the, rev the revolution occurred and the declaration was passed, all of the colonial governments formed new state governments. And you're going to see that that was part of the experience. But you have to remember when you read the Declaration, the Americans thought that they were the subject of tyranny. And they analyzed the source of the tyranny that they considered the British government to have subjected them to. And you'd have to say that they came down to two conclusions. The reason uh, that the British government drifted into tyranny, especially over the colonists, the American colonists, were because one, it was a centralized empire with concentrated power in a, se a center of government far away from the governed. After all, there was 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean that separated. But Britain at one time, of course, was the largest empire in the world. There was the, uh, the saying in the early 1800s that the sun never set on the British Empire, and indeed it didn't. The British Empire was the largest empire in human history. And so, in some ways, the Americans thought that the reason that British government had become so tyrannical, starting with the Stamp Act and all those things, was because it had it was an it was an empire with too much power in one center. Bearing in that mind, you'll see why they created such a weak national government. They didn't want the American centralized government to fall into the same tendencies of tyranny and centralized power that they blamed or accused the British government of. But since Second Britain, the British government was a monarchy. And at the heart of the British Constitution, still to some degree, although, of course, the British Constitution, although it has the same institutions today that it had then, it's a very different, it has evolved in different ways. Nevertheless, at the heart of the British Constitution is the Queen, which was the King, King George III. And King George III was a much more powerful king then in the British Constitution. So the second analysis of the tyranny that the colonists suffered was that the King was a tyrant. And so if you understand, and, and this was, you'll see, this was their primary mistake, but it was an, it was an easy mistake to make. They thought that 
tyranny was primarily the result of monarchy. And as you'll see, when they designed the government of the Articles on the national level, but even the state governments under the Articles, they tried to address the problem of a potentially tyrannous, tyrannical executive by, one, on the national level, not even having an executive, and two, um, on the state level, having executives, but having them weak and subordinate to the state legislatures. During the revolution, you'd have to say that the king was the villain and the colonial legislatures where the resistance against the, Bron the British <coughs> was formulated and policy uh, uh, formed until Congress formed during uh, the Second Continental Congress, you'd have to say that, that in general, the Americans saw the legislature as, as the most democratic branch of government, therefore the least tyrannical, and, uh, and therefore they designed governments that either had no executive on the national level <coughs> Or had weak executives, they because they're in their naivete. They thought the problem of tyranny was solved. One way of putting the bitter lesson that they learned over the next eleven years was, tyranny just doesn't come from a king. Tyranny can come from a legislature too, or even a judiciary. And as you'll see, the deepest lesson they learned is, even the people themselves can be tyrannical. More about that later. So. So you'd have to say that, the, as I put in my notes, the second reason for the defect of the Articles was for this, in the, the, the Declaration and the Revolution and loosed, it loosed a certain enthusiasm for local democracy. And if good government was reducible to democracy, that would be, that would be fine. But as you're going to see, the framers did not reject democracy or, or abandon it, but they realized that democracy was incapable of creating good government. Uh, and that's why, as you'll see, the Constitution is a modified embrace of democratic influence. So what were then the defects of the Articles of Confederation? I've, um, I've divided these into two broad areas, on the national level and on the state level, and in turn, on the national level, uh, into two parts. So the way that you could say was, Americans, every American wanted America to be a nation. They had a sense that they had fought from the war together. There was common blood, a common baptism of the war. George Washington was the most famous and beloved America besides Benjamin Franklin um, at the time. And so every American wanted America to be a nation. But, but you'll see that the Articles tried to create a nation without a national government because they were too afraid of a centralized national government. So what they did was, was really create a weak confederation of sovereign states. We're going to come back to that theme a lot. So the first set of insufficiencies of the articles, and you can, when you read all 13 articles for the PRQs, you'll see that Congress is granted powers, but they're not, Congress isn't granted, and there's only one institution, when I'll come to structure in a minute, there was no separation of powers, as I mentioned. So one problem with the National Congress was it had insufficient power to govern a nation. Uh, it could not tax Americans directly. It could only ask for voluntary contributions or requisitions from the state states, which is why it was always broke. It never had enough money to govern. Second, it couldn't raise an army or defend the nation with a national army because they were afraid of the standing armies that the king had imposed with the quartering of troops and everything mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. So the Congress could not create a national army. It could request the states to send a uh, militia or, uh, or, or to provide troops, which would then be under national command, but it couldn't actually raise an army itself. So you had a national government that was constantly broke and constantly enfeebled and in, unable. And it shouldn't take you too long to realize that the field of international relations is not exactly uh, a prayer meeting. It's a pretty harsh thing where if you don't have an army to protect your country or assert yourself or your interests, you're going to get run over. And so they were. I mentioned as part of the, uh, the Treaty of Paris the British agreed to conditions in this Treaty of Paris, which they never obeyed. And the problem is the only way to make a foreign power obey something it's agreed to is to put some teeth in it and put some force behind it. But the, the federal government under the Articles had no, no money and no military power. Second, a third, I should say, in foreign affairs, it did ask Congress to be the main representative. After all, what's the point of having a national center uh, if you're not going to have the nation represented by that national power? but it also allowed the states to form their own foreign policy. They were supposed to check with Congress before they made a treaty with another power, but they often didn't, and they often conducted foreign affairs 
uh, from their own state capitals. So you had a natural incoherence in foreign policy. Um, and uh, there was no power to regulate commerce. Each state would regulate like it, it was like Europe before the common market and before the European Union. You could say that to some degree, each state, because it was sovereign and considered itself an independent country, passed legislation, commercial legislation that benefited itself. It would often have tariffs for goods to go from one state to another and often prohibited states from selling commerce in other. As a result, not only did you have the natural depression of the wartime circumstances, but it was made worse by Congress's inability to pass national laws to further and benefit commerce. Um, and last, of course, because the states were sovereign, it was a confederation and the members of the union, as you'll see, were sovereign states. More about this in a minute. Uh, the states had the final authority in the system. The, con the, the articles asks the states pretty please <laughs> to obey the articles and the Congress. But when push come to shove, there was no enforcement mechanism. So, of course, the states did not. They did not comply with the articles. They did not comply with the Congress. And hence, the nation was descending into a decentralized chaos. So, as you'll see when we turn to the Constitutional Convention, all of the proposed forms of government addressed each of these problems to some degree. Now, the second great defect of the national government was it hadn't, didn't have the structure of a government. It had no separation of powers. It only had one Congress. And you can see how the Congress were formed. Each state could send between two to seven uh, uh, um, uh, um, representatives uh, chosen by the state governments, salaries paid by the state governments, not by the national government. And so in some ways, the states completely controlled the Congress. And, and this is structural defect, which goes to the very heart of confederation. Again, the Congress, the, uh, to no surprise, its name tells you what it is. The Articles of Confederation was a confederation of sovereign states. There was a union, the United States of America. But as you'll see, the uh, confederation can't preserve a nation. The United Nations is something like a global confederation, but look how weak and effective the United Nations is. So in some ways, our, our Articles of Confederation. So in, as you'll see, when we turn to the Constitutional Convention, um, part of the problem that many of the delegates saw was that uh, sovereignty less rested on the state level. The members of the union were the states. There was an American people but there was no institutional representation of the American people on the national level in the Congress. Uh, in the same way that the world's people, uh, the people of the world are not represented in the UN. The governments of the nations of the world are represented in the UN. We don't vote for our UN representative and our government under the articles was exactly the same way. So the, the core defect of the articles was that it was a confederation of sovereign states. Uh, the American people as a sovereign entity with a national government had not yet come into being. It comes into being with the first words of the Constitution, which we'll become very familiar with, and some of you are already, we the people, not we the states, but we the people of the United States of America. But then the second structural defect was the lack of a, a separation of powers, no executive branch. Why no executive branch? Uh, because they were afraid of a national executive, that it would become a king. So they didn't have one, no judicial branch. All cases involving national laws were settled by the state judiciaries, which meant you often had one national law, but then 13 different interpretations. So uh, not only in its confederal structure, but in the structure of the national government itself, you had a government that was not in effect a government. The second great problem was on the state level, because even though all the colonies became states and under the doctrine of the, Art of the Declaration of Independence, they formed their own governments, deriving their consent from the governed, Many of them formed uh, legislative dominated uh, governments because they were afraid of the executive branch. They all had governors. All the 13 states had governors, but only in two states were the governors elected independent. In all the other states, the, ele the, the, the state legislature elected the government, the, go the governor. And of course, if you tr hire somebody and you can control his salary and can fire him at will, you control them. So you'll see the state executives had no power to resist the state legislatures, and the same with the judiciaries. As a result, on the state level, which tended to put all the power in the hands of the legislature because it was the most democratic one, you'll see the problem was legislative tyranny, not executive tyranny, but legislative tyranny. More about that 
in the convention and in Federalist 51. So um, that was the great problem. And of course, because the state legislatures were dominated by democratic uh, public sentiment, it turned out that, as I said earlier, the bitter lesson was that the people themselves can become tyrannical. The majority can come to tyrannize over the minority. So the problem with the state governments was not only just legislative domination within the government, it was too intense and immediate uh, control of the legislature by democratic opinion with no ability, no protection for the minority. That becomes the basis, you'll see, of some of the most brilliant aspects of the American Constitution. Now, before we turn away from the articles and think that it was just one big failure, um, it was a one, slow, was one long, slow failure, but there were successes, and we should remember that. The, first of all, the articles did hold the country together during this period. Even at the time they were failing, it gave the country an opportunity and its leaders to step back in the midst of their woes and the dis dissolution of the social and economic and political fabric of the country. It still was a framework which was stable enough to hold the country together until a new system could be created and adopted. You have to give the articles credit for that. Second, uh, it did pass one great and important piece of legislation, the Northwest Ordinance of uh, 1787 by which it would, recognize, it would recognize the territories up until the western border, which was the Mississippi River, new procedures for new states coming in. It banned slavery uh, above a certain latitude, and it created and supported religious institutions and religious schools. So probably the single most um, successful piece of legislation was important for the country's eventual growth, and that was the Northwest Ordinance. So uh, it was a failure overall, it had some successes, but it clearly was not capable of holding the country together or leading to its stability, prosperity, or the freedom of its inhabitants. And that leads us to the movement towards the Constitutional Convention. Sometimes it's called the Federal Convention. It's, historians call it both. And at the time, it was called both the Constitutional Convention and the Federal Convention. I've already mentioned Shays' Rebellion. That's the event that sent the shock through the American continent that said to the political elites that, that the fabric of the country was falling apart. But the immediate one that I've already mentioned was the Annapolis Convention in September of 1786. Madison and Hamilton uh, had persuaded the Congress, of which they were members, to call a convention in Annapolis, hence the Annapolis Convention, whose only aim, as I mentioned earlier, was to beef up the commercial power of the Congress under the Articles to regulate. Uh, it failed only five states. But... Uh, the success was Madison and Hamilton got the attending delegates to adopt a resolution sent back to Congress to call another convention. And as you'll see on the last page of the notes at the bottom, that's exactly what Congress did. Um, on February 21st, um, uh, Congress adopted the resolution, and I'll read it. And, and we'll come, this is where we'll start on Wednesday, by the way. So uh, the resolution of the Congress uh, of the uh, under the Articles, on February 22nd, uh, 1787. Resolution resolved that in the opinion of Congress, it is expedient that on the second Monday in May, which would have been May 14th, by the way, hold on to that when we come to the dates of the convention, in um, May next, in the next May, a convention of delegates who shall have been appointed by the several states be held at Philadelphia for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. So, in, and, and when we start with this on Wednesday, note, the express mean, meaning open, the main purpose of the Constitutional Convention was not to design a new constitution, but to fix the Articles, revise and enlarge. And that language led to one of the first major disagreements of the convention that almost tore it apart. Because most of the delegates clearly came to the Philadelphia Convention in uh, understanding that their main business was not to abandon the Articles and create a new one, uh, but rather to fix the existing ones. So hold on to that. And uh, uh, revising, express purpose of revising and enlarging the Articles and reporting to Congress and the several legislatures such alterations and provisions therein as shall, when agreed to in Congress and confirmed by the states, render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies 
I'm going to assume that most of you don't know what the word exigency means. Exigent exigency means necessities, urgent necessity of government and the preservation of the union. Now, the second part of that phrase, the last part, to come up with something that will make this federal government strong enough to govern the nation, that language turns out to be a little looser than the earlier language and the tension between simply revising, fixing the articles and coming up with a solution that would actually solve the nation's problems in the wiggle room between those two parts of this resolution, uh, uh, as you're going to see, the framers created the Constitution, which it turns out was not a revision of the Articles. The Constitution was a new form of government. It was, it was in fact, something like a second revolution. And that gives truth to Diamond's statement in his article that the completion of the American Revolution and the promise of the Declaration was actually the brilliant Constitution of the United States the convention of which and its creation will turn to on Wednesday.